Okay, um, I'll tell you a little bit about um, the Foreign Service, I suppose, and then I'll just uh, go straight through to talking about uh, how you apply, maybe some hints for studying for the test, and I'll try to make it short because I know it's getting late and you sat very patiently through all that stuff on internships. So if you ever need to reach me, um, DIR North Central at state.gov is a good way um, because even if I'm out of town or traveling, uh, that mailbox is monitored also by my colleague, my co-recruiter in Washington, D.C., and she can answer emails too. And she's a Foreign Service Specialist um, and also a veteran of the military, so she covers a lot of areas that I don't, and that's, that's pretty cool. Okay, you all know and love probably careers.state.gov. Um, and in order to apply, you, there are a number of stages, I almost said hoops to jump through, a number of stages um, that are necessary for you to make it through the process. Um, yes, I guess the, the numbers up front, about 25,000 people take the test every year. Um, we hire fewer than 1,000 in a typical year. Uh, it's something like a 2 to 4% um, hiring uh, percentage of people who uh, actually take the test. Yes, it's highly competitive. Um, but I've been diplomat in residence only for a few months, but I've, having been through the test myself and observed it on the other side, um, it's a very fair process. It's, you know, I feel very proud of it, and it really is considered a gold standard because it evaluates you in many different capacities um, in the way that you communicate, uh, in the way that you work with other people. Um, and yeah, it just seems like a very good way of judging people because it's not all one dimension. Um, I've had friends in foreign services of, of other countries, um, European countries mainly, but also in Asia. And in those countries, oftentimes it's, you know, who your father went to school with or um, where you live or who you know. and. You know, I'm always proud to say that I came from a blue-collar family. I went to community college. I waitressed my way through eastern Michigan. And, uh, you know, here I am. So it is possible for people from the Midwest, from people who didn't go to an Ivy League school, and people who are not well-connected uh, to make it into the Foreign Service and have a great time doing it. So that's, that's my little spiel. Anyway. You'll oftentimes hear Foreign Service people talk about the 13 dimensions, and I said it's sort of a multifaceted way of looking at the candidates. This is the way we evaluate people. Um, composure, you know, if you think about some of the places Foreign Service officers typically serve, being composed under stress is really important. Um, I told you I just came out of a tour in Afghanistan. You always have the threat of violence and terrorism at the back of your mind, but you, you still have to do your job. You still have to interview the Fulbright applicants. You still have to welcome the uh, congressional delegation that's coming and be composed if something happens to throw you off the track or a program gets canceled or something changes. You just have to stay calm. Cultural adaptability, you're going to be working with colleagues who have very different beliefs from yours. You're going to be doing outreach to people who don't speak your language, don't have your religion, your values, who have very different economic circumstances, so can you handle that? Are you motivated to join the Foreign Service by factors other than, you know, it sounds glamorous and the pay is pretty good? You need something driving you from within uh, if you really want this to be your career. That sounds very fancy, but what I take it to mean is can you assimilate a lot of information and make sense out of it and boil it down to its, um, you know, boil it down to its essence and explain it to other people coherently? Um, do you remember details well? Um, initiative and leadership, a lot of that is leading other people without letting them know that you're leading them. <laughs> um, being persistent in getting things done even when obstacles happen, even when you know, the embassy shuts down or there's a duck and cover alert in the middle of your Fulbright interview, which actually happened to me. What do you do? Well, you figure out a way around the obstacle. Um, judgment. 
what can you get done in a given situation? What's practical for you to accomplish? Um, oftentimes you'll have so many different demands on your time that you have to figure out what's most important, what's the priority, what would the American people want me to do? I guess that's kind of everybody, everybody in the Foreign Service, that's kind of their inner compass. I'm here representing the American people, what's the most important thing for me to do in their stead? Objectivity and integrity, I think about that being, a lot of that is about being able to admit you made a mistake. And sometimes you have to do that in a very public way as a diplomat. And that ain't easy. I've had to do it and it's, you know, you wake up in the middle of the night thinking about it, but it's always better to come clean and admit you've made a mistake and, and be honest about it. Um, working without letting personal bias prejudice you or influence you, that's another big part of it. Um, explaining things well is a huge part of the job. Because again, you're in a completely different culture and sometimes the cultures clash. You have to be able to communicate to people in a way that both sides will understand. Organization, again, it's about prioritizing competing tasks. Um, I've never heard an embassy overseas complain, oh, we've got way too much money. How are we going to spend this money? Everybody complains in every job. We have limited resources. How do we best use them? You know, what's the best, most appropriate way to use the resources that we have? Analyzing a lot of different information, recognizing patterns. Um, one of the examples I mentioned before is that uh, one of my friends on the visa line noticed that um, all the applicants that came in from this tiny little village in Eastern Europe seemed to have fraudulent documents. And she couldn't figure out why just this small subset all seemed to have fake birth certificates or fake statements of work. And so she noticed a pattern. Um, she told the regional security officer, he went and did a little investigating. There was a guy selling fake documents and uh, you know trading favors for the fake documents in this tiny little village. He uh, he was very well trained and the documents were difficult to detect. But once she saw the pattern, she was able to you know find a bad guy. Creative alternatives to solutions uh, or solutions to resolve problems. Figuring out again ways around obstacles because overseas they'll happen. You know, you'll be in the middle of a big, beautiful Fourth of July party and the power will go out. What do you do? How do you handle that? Um, the Thanksgiving turkeys you ordered for everybody in the embassy, they don't show up. What do you do? Everybody's going to be disappointed. How do I handle this? Working with other people, I mean, in Afghanistan, there were about a thousand of us Americans confined on a very small compound. If you don't get along well with people, if you're loud and obnoxious, if you're abrasive, word will get around pretty fast. Um, so working effectively as part of a team is really important too. And of course writing. I've said over and over again how important good writing is. Um, writing well under pressure. You'll find that out when you take the test and you get 30 minutes to write a well-organized uh, persuasive, coherent, cohesive essay on a topic you've never seen before. 30 minutes. Goes by pretty fast. So, in the written test, almost all of these are being examined one way or the other. Not the oral communication, but you'll be asked questions about that. Um, registering for the Foreign Service Officer test, those of you who have done it, it's pretty easy process, right? Pretty straightforward. Um, we do offer the test every October. We just finished a session. It's about a two-week window in those months, October, February, and June. Um, you can test only once every 12 months, not calendar year, but 12 months. Um, one of the biggest reasons I took the test in the first place was somebody told me, it doesn't cost anything. It doesn't. They do ask you for a credit card to guarantee your seat. If you register and don't show up, you'll be charged 50 bucks. But um, other than that, it doesn't cost a thing. It's the, the, beauty of, the beauty of a test that's fair. OK. Um, I'll skip through these pretty quickly. Job knowledge. This does not assume that you know the inner workings of an embassy. This is kind of the, the common sense component. 
um, what would you do in this situation if, if X happened? English expression and, and usage, um, that measures how good a writer you are. Um, can you read critically and analyze what you read? Biographic information, oh, I, I'll talk more about this later, but it's really useful in this portion of the test if you have, I don't know how else to say it, reviewed your life before this point. Um, because you may be asked to give examples of different aspects of um, behavior that are useful when you go into the Foreign Service. Is there a time in your life when you've been a leader? And you, you say, yeah, sure. Can you give me an example? And then you go, oh, no. When was I a leader? And you frantically, and that little counter is ticking down in the corner of the screen, and you're thinking, leadership, leadership. What did I do that showed leadership? So go back, look at your CV. Um, think about the jobs that you've done. Think about courses you've had, volunteering you've done. Just sort of review your life in the context of, this is a big, big job interview. Can you provide examples of certain desired behaviors? And the essay, um, nobody cares what your political view is or what you're arguing in the essay. We don't care if you're a li libertarian or a democrat or republican or socialist. If you can write well and defend your opinion well and be coherent about it, that's what we're looking for there, not what your political views are. The knowledge areas that are um, discussed in the first part of the four, um, these are all pretty standard. But a lot of it is about, um, again, common sense, general knowledge. Do you know and understand your own country? Can you explain it to other people? What are the principles that we were founded on? Um, what are important aspects of American culture? So skipping through that very quickly. US government, um, one thing I found very handy when I was reviewing for the test, I got one of those little pocket copies of the US Constitution and read it over because I hadn't had government class since 12th grade. And, you know, I knew in a vague sense principles, founding fathers, but I read the Constitution, the Declaration, um, I looked at major Supreme Court cases, important documents in American society. Um, world history and geography, if your grasp of geography is weak, uh, maps.com is a pretty good place to go, or there are lots of quizzes about geography online. Uh, U.S. culture, American poets, composers. Again, it's not going to be obscure little things like what's the publication date of The Great Gatsby or who was the sixth, well, that one's easy, who is the 25th president of the United States. Not anything like that, but major issues, major movements. What were the 1960s all about? Why were they important? Why were they a turning point in American culture? Um, preparing, does anybody use this uh, mobile app? Yeah. Did they send you a question a day or something? Um, no, they have a bunch of practice exams okay. on there and the little, you know, which track you want to be tested. It's actually really good. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. It's good. They have like um, practice tests broken down by these different subjects. Oh, great. So if you okay. want to just study economics, there's like five or something ec exams with all like 20 questions on. So. It's okay. good when you're on the bus, or? Yeah. Okay, yeah, maps.com, map games. The reading list, if you go to the state.gov website and look at it, is very intimidating. <laughs> you don't have to read the whole thing. Um, but figure out what areas you might have weaknesses in, and then go to the reading list and maybe pick up a couple of the things there um, that might help you address your weaknesses. Um, I was very weak in economics. I hadn't, I'd never had an econ course. I didn't know the basic principles. I didn't have time to take an econ course. I was working full time. So, you know, what do you do? I got the Penguin Dictionary of Economics, and I read that for sort of major terms, major movements. I did the same thing with um, a little pocket dictionary of politics, just so I'd know what the terms meant, um, what the major developments were. People have told me it's very similar to the SAT or the GRE, sort of in format. Um, and in structure. SAT prep books are really good. Um, Strunk and White, you know, Elements of Style, that's kind of the classic for writing. 
Chicago manual of style is also very good. And yeah, like I said, review your life, <laughs> your resume, your transcripts. You might have forgotten a really interesting course you took on the, I don't know, Arab-Israeli conflict or trafficking in persons or women's rights in uh, the African continent or something like that. So just list everything down so on test day you can give examples when you're asked. When were you a leader? When did you have a course that was outside your subject area? You all are pros at taking standardized tests or you wouldn't be sitting in this room. So um, take an educated guess if you don't know. That's the best, uh, best advice I can possibly give you. Um, you know, I would say you probably have a two out of four chance of getting it right because usually you can eliminate one or two right off the bat. Okay, this is important to know. Um, the multiple choice section is graded right then and there. You don't know, you, on, on a pass-fail basis, I should say. You're only allowed to proceed to the essay portion if you have passed the multiple choice exam. So that tells you something. I don't know what happens if you, know, you get the blue screen of death and they tell you to go home or <laughs> exactly what happens. But um, if you are told to proceed to the essay portion, then you know that at least you got a passing score on the multiple choice section. 30 minutes goes by very fast. Um, prepare, do it over and over again. Um, ask somebody to read over your essays. The, the five paragraph model, that's pretty standard. Um, I taught English composition for many years. That's what I always taught my students. Yes? So is the entire test taken on a computer? Yep. Okay. It is. Like the GRE then? Yes. Okay. It wasn't back in my day. I used Scantrons, <laughs> if anybody remembers those. And I actually took my test uh, overseas, which was an interesting experience. Which you can do if you happen to be overseas. You can go to a U.S. Embassy if you're registered and, and take it there. So then for this test, is there like a standard bar that you just had to pass before you move on to the next like, stage, like stage two? Or is it, do you guys just take the highest scores for that? Component? Depends on what the cutoff point is for that particular intake. So you're told in, how long was it before you found out how you did? I, I'm in like a slightly different program, so, but I'm trying to think of when I did take I it. I just took it, they told us yeah. three to four weeks, yeah. and it was about three weeks ago, and I haven't heard back yet. So okay. Four or four -ish weeks, maybe? Four or five weeks, and then you find out how you did, what your score was. Depending on what your score is, they're all ranked. If your score is high enough, then you proceed to the next. Does that happen? No, okay. Then you proceed to the next stage, uh, which is the QEP qualifications. The examinations panel. Yes, so you'll write thank you. write personal narratives. So if you, if you like, pass like yeah. the multiple choice questions and then you pass the essay, then you're invited to write, I want to say it's six essays, it might be five. Six, yeah. And so that's just speaking about your own personal experiences, usually in relation to a specific um, dimension of the 13, and the questions will be very specific. And then from there, you're kind of chosen by the Yeah. So it just depends on what the cutoff score is for that cohort taking the exam. So yeah, you can be invited to take further delightful essay questions or not. Um, just a few more things on the written exam. Here, I'll back up because I think I skipped over some stuff. Yeah, past essay questions from study guides. I don't, as a former English professor, I, I really resent recommending Cliff's notes, but okay, they're good for essay topics if you want to set yourself practice essay topics or make up your own. Washington Post has a quiz every week on um, current events or what's happened this week, what was important, who were the movers and shakers. Make up a question, write an answer, show it to somebody. Um, show it to somebody who, whose um, judgment you trust. Okay, yeah, if you feel like you crashed and burned on one section, don't give up, just keep on going because you can make it up by a uh, comparatively high score on other ones. And, you know, it's not the end of the world if you don't pass. I've, I show a little video uh, before the FSOT prep session or info session sometimes, and 
there are various Foreign Service officers in that saying how many times it took them before they passed the Foreign Service officer test. One guy says, well, it took me three times. I know somebody who took it seven times before he passed. And it doesn't count against you. It shows that you're persistent and that you really want this. So don't worry about it. Um, yes, eat a good breakfast like you know your parents always told you, but don't drink too much because you don't get very many bathroom breaks. You do sign a non-disclosure um, that you won't reveal the content of the questions uh, you know, uh, once you take the test, so it's against the rules. Do not forget your ID as someone who got a speeding ticket because my daughter was taking the SAT and needed to go back home to get her ID. So don't forget your ID. <laughs> Little story. Um, it also helps if you're taking the, the test in a place that's really unfamiliar to you or a city you've never visited before. If you can possibly go there the day before, did yeah. you have a bad experience? I highly recommend that. I took mine up at MSU when I was an undergrad here at Eastern, yeah. so I don't think I'd even ever been to campus before. And so I showed up the day of, I didn't really know where to park, I couldn't really find a building, and I literally had to kind of run there. So I showed up to the test and I was very sweaty, and it was kind of uncomfortable. And I just really recommend that you find the testing center beforehand, because yeah. if it's in a place that you're not familiar with, you'll be really nervous and you'll just, it was, it was, it was bad. Yeah. I was stressed. Give yourself a lot, twice as much time as you think you're going to need, I think. Okay, questions. I know that was kind of tiny little details about the exam. If you have questions about the Foreign Service or other stuff, I'm happy to try to answer. Does the State Department offer career opportunities outside of being a Foreign Service officer? I know that's probably a really stupid question, but... It's not a stupid question, and yes, we do. Um, there are opportunities as uh, Foreign Service specialists. Um, where you're more like a subject matter expert, and they also serve in embassies overseas and in Washington, D.C., um, but they don't go, go through quite the same process that the Foreign Service officers do. Um, there are also the civil service opportunities, and they are based in Washington, D.C. Um, and again, they're subject matter experts, and they back us up overseas. And would you find these positions on USA Jobs? Um, the, if you go to... Or the careers. Yeah, careers. That's the best place to start. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. And you can sign up for the email alerts. So every time we'll yep. just send you an email. Yeah, you can sign up for the email alerts for um, particular keywords on USA Jobs. Um, you can go in and check the boxes that say, I want to know about internships, civil service, I don't know geophysics opportunities, translator opportunities, whatever your particular area of interest is. And then they'll shoot you an email when that comes open. But go back and check your preferences every once in a while because it's an opt-in kind of system. So you have to make sure it's current. Other questions? Yeah. Um, what is the average age of people who apply? Does it really matter if you're fresh out of um, undergrad or not? No, um, statistically, for my class, the average age was 32 on entry. But that being said, the youngest person in my ingoing class was 22. He turned 23 during orient orientation. The oldest one was 55. So it really, you know, as long as you can pass the exam um, and, and get through all the different stages. But yeah, the average age is, I think, early 30s. It might actually be dropping a little bit now. Yeah. If you do pass the exam and get offered a position as, for, as an FSO, mm -hmm. do you have, are you obligated, to, if they tell you, well, you're going here or there, mm -hmm. are you obligated to go there or are you able to say, no, I don't want that? Like, can the State Department force you to go to different places? That very rarely happens, but right. bottom line is you have to agree to be worldwide available. Right. Um, you know, I went to Afghanistan, I volunteered to go why I felt like it was my turn, you know, because my colleagues had been doing the job and I was at a point in my life where I was able to volunteer to go. Um, it's very rare that people are forced to go somewhere they don't want to go. Um, and most of the time, if you have, you know, a family issue or a health consideration or children in school, your career um, development officer will work with you to figure out some kind of solution. 
but yeah, again, bottom line is you have to, when you sign up, when you sign, you know, the, the, on the dotted line, the day you enter, you do agree that you'll be worldwide available. So, and that means everywhere. And some of the, the places you think would be terrible to serve in are actually the most interesting, at least they were for me. So, other questions? Yeah. Um, is registration open yet for the February date, or does it take a while? I have not checked. Anybody know? I think the yeah, October date October. is still posted on okay. it. But yeah, just keep checking. Um, it did not fill up that fast last time. In fact, I think it was still possible to sign up uh, towards the end of the period, um, at the beginning of the period. Other questions? Okay, well, if you're shy or something occurs to you in the middle of the night, feel free to email me or, or stop by or give me a phone call. I'm, I'm always happy to answer questions. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to make a small plug, especially for undergraduates out there. So if the Foreign Service is definitely something that you want to do, um, and you also want to go to graduate school, there are programs that are funded, they're funded through different places, but technically it's all through the State Department, and basically they pay for your graduate school, and then afterwards you're obligated to work as a Foreign Service Officer for three years, so again, it's for someone who absolutely knows they want to be a Foreign Service Officer and still wants to go to graduate school. So there's the Pickering, Pickering. Fellowship and the Wrangell Fellowship. Um, I'm a Pickering Fellow, so if you're an undergraduate and thinking about applying, that application's not going to be due, I think, until January, but... Um, Happy to chat with you about it, and it is a really great opportunity because you can do the grad school and then you're guaranteed an inroad into the Foreign Service. So it's a, they're really cool programs, and I highly encourage you if you're an undergraduate thinking about grad school, thinking about Foreign Service, look into it and definitely apply. Yeah, and the Pickering Chair is going to be here. Yes. Tuesday. I'm meeting with him tomorrow, but I don't know when he's doing events on this campus. Okay. Yeah, but check with the Career Services Office because this is the um, former ambassador who uh, actually runs the Pickering program out of Washington, D.C., and he can answer questions, he can, you know, tell you what it's like to apply. Um, let's see, the Wrangell program also just opened up, um, closes, I believe, January. I think that's when they both kind of close. Yes, so. it's right around the same schedule. They're quite similar, but a few of the details with each program are a little bit different. But yeah, they're fantastic programs. And we're very proud to have Pickerings and Wrangles here at U of M too. I definitely want to recruit more, so could yeah. speak more highly of the program. And yeah, so before you're a senior now, already thinking about grad school, come chat with me. It's a cool program. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.